Let us let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the workers' retreat we're having now, and we pray that these few hours we'll spend today and the few hours we'll spend tomorrow, you'll bless every one of us tremendously in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you'll prepare us for the work ahead so that the work in this district will have a real progress in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that all the things we learn and all the things we share together will be of a benefit to everyone and you'll make us channels of blessings for other people. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We appeal to those who are having children that uh, those children should be kept very quiet. We do not want children running about uh, while the program is going on. So you really have to sit with your children and get them under control. Let's try to stop to sing together. Jesus only is our message. Jesus, all our theme shall be. We we'll lift up Jesus ever. Jesus only will we see. Jesus only, Jesus ever. Jesus, all in all, will sing. Savior, sanctifier, healer, baptizer, and the coming king. Mm. Jesus only.
kwanza 6 From 2 Timothy chapter 2, Second Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Here Paul the Apostle was concerned with the church. The reason he wrote to Timothy is that Timothy will be able to know how to conduct himself in the church of the living God and how he will be able to handle the work that God had committed into his hand. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Paul the Apostle was concerned that young Timothy, as a minister, will know how to shepherd how to feed, how to tend, how to nurture, how to care, how to direct, how to influence the church of the living God. And Paul the Apostle knew that to do all these things, that Timothy will need to know how to behave himself in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar, the ground, the support, the foundation of the truth. And so he also wanted Timothy to get other people involved. That's why in the place I've read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul the Apostle knew that the ministry of teaching was very important in the church of the living God. And yet he knew that the time was coming that people will not be able to endure the real teaching of the word of God. So he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. He wanted Timothy, therefore, to take care of the ministry of teaching. One, Timothy himself needed to know how he will behave himself in the house of God, in the church of the living God. He also needed to know how he will find 
faithful men who will be appointed as teachers, leaders, guides for the children of God. And in this chapter, Paul the Apostle spoke about those people, Timothy himself and the faithful men that will support him, assist him in the work of the Lord. And he spoke about those people as soldiers of the cross, soldiers of Christ. Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as Paul the Apostle used that language, obviously, Timothy must have begun to think the lifestyle of the soldier. And then Paul the Apostle moved on to say that the people that will serve the Lord in that capacity, Timothy and the people following after him, they'll be like well-trained athletes. Verse 5. If a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. That is, we must know the rules of the game, the rules of the ministry, and the principles that we need to know, just like at least we learn the principles that they need for the work. And then Paul moved on and said, the person that will work like that must be like the farmer that tills the ground, that cultivates the ground, that sows the seed, that keeps on protecting the seed and taking care of the weed, and then watches on and is patient until the time of the harvest. And it says in verse 6, The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. And as he goes on, after showing Timothy and the faithful men that he will select to support himself, to surround himself as soldier, as athlete, as farmers, he says, but he must be like a student who is always studying, in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He had spoken about the soldier, unless the Christian worker should think, all the discipline I need, all the training I need, I have gone through everything when I was recruited. He now says, he must be like a workman that is always updating his knowledge, studying to show himself approved unto God. He has spoken like the athlete, about the athlete. Unless the Christian worker should think, like the athlete, I've received all the training that I need, and I know how to run, I know the rules of the game, I know how to win, I'm a champion in my athletics already. He says, but it's like a student, studying to show himself approved unto God. And he will never be approved unto God if he stops learning. Because he must be a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, dividing the word of truth. He has spoken about the farmer. Unless the person should think, like a farmer, I know the season to sow. I know when to cultivate the ground. And I know when to sow the seed. And I know everything like a farmer. I do not have any other thing to, to read or to study. So Paul the Apostle says, but you are like a student. And you study to show yourself approved unto God. And he wanted Timothy and the people that supported the ministry, with Timothy to understand that if you are exactly today like you were two years ago, you'll never be approved of God. Because God expects that will be more intimate with him, more in fellowship with him, and that you will be coming to maturity. And if you are stagnant, if you are always at the same place, you'll never be approved unto God. So Timothy and all those other faithful men, keep on learning, keep on studying, keep on preparing yourself, and keep on getting nearer unto the Lord. But then he talks about this person, and he says it's a vessel. And it ought to be a vessel unto honor. It says in verse 20, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. He wanted Timothy to understand that he had likened the Christian worker. 
to the soldier, to the athlete, to the farmer, to the student. But then he wanted them to understand all those people involved in the ministry that there are things that disqualify a minister from being a vessel unto honor. And that Timothy should strive to be a vessel unto honor in a great house. And then he goes on in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Here he assured Timothy that if he was going to be a person that was useful in the household of faith, he must be like a servant. And then the servant has a particular behavior that he must put forth so that he'll be able to do what he ought to do. And today, as we come together as workers in the vineyard of the Lord, we must begin to ask ourselves some questions. In all these that we have learned about a soldier, before a soldier joins the army, he becomes, he must be qualified. That's why we recruit him. But then along the way, there are things that could happen to him. Deformity, or a sustained accident, or it may be that he loses his eyesight, or it may be that in behavior is no more in control, is not a disciplined man. And when he becomes a person like that, that is not a disciplined man, not a diligent man, and is a person that has lost vital parts of members of the body, though qualified originally, he becomes disqualified. About athletes, originally, when they are chosen, they have to be qualified. That's why they're preparing for athletics or for the Olympics in those days. But then along the line, there may be a weight that is pulling them down. On, along the line, there may be a hindrance that will not be able to make them to run the race before them. Qualified, but eventually they become disqualified. It may be a farmer that originally, as he went forth to plant, he secured a good parcel of land and he could cultivate. But along the line, he wasn't able to plant the way he ought to plant. And he wasn't able to harvest the way he ought to harvest. And eventually, even though he had been called and qualified to be a farmer, when it comes to getting to the market and to bring the produce or the products to the market, is disqualified. He has nothing to show for the work he's doing. Now, as students, you know, as uh, people that maybe you have been a student yourself in the past, or it may be you have had colleagues that have been students with you in the past, or we have children, or we have junior ones, brothers and sisters. When they took entrance exam, they were qualified, and therefore they entered into the school. It may be because they did not know the rules and regulations in the school. Or it may be they started to follow vagabonds. It may be that they began to get involved with immorality. Eventually, they become disqualified. Qualified originally, when they took the entrance exam, it may be they have mental problem now, and therefore they have to be sent away. They cannot study anymore. It may be that something, an injury has happened that has disqualified them to continue studying. Qualified first, but later disqualified. And we have looked at vessels. Vessels of honor or vessels of dishonor. Well, we have known in our own houses, when you have brought a particular vessel out, maybe a plate, and you could serve a visitor. You are proud of serving that visitor with that plate. But maybe your little child did not handle that plate very well. It became dented or a little bit broken or mad in one way or the other. And because of that blemish on that plate, that plate now is no more a vessel unto honor. You have to put it among the plates that you'll just use for ordinary things. Some of the buckets you used before in taking your bath and doing some other things, now you just make it a waste paper uh, bu bucket. You cannot use it for honor anymore because something has dented that thing. The value you placed on that vessel before, you cannot place that vessel on it or you cannot place that honor on it anymore. 
originally vessel unto honor, but now unto dishonor. Qualified originally, but now disqualified. And we have known of servants, obviously. And these were servants that they were qualified. Qualified to serve in the palace of the king. Qualified to serve in a highly placed um, place of work. But now, because of something that happened, even though they had not been totally terminated, they have been disqualified from working very near the king, very near the master. And so, in all these symbols, all these types, all these illustrations that have been given concerning the servants of God, the workers in the vineyard, we need to understand that you may be qualified originally, but along the line, some things may happen that will disqualify you. And if you have been disqualified, you'll know it between you, between yourself and the Lord, that some things have come into your life to disqualify you from the work of the Lord. The joy of it or the beauty of it is that we can come back and say, Lord, when I started, I know the way I started. And I know that I was qualified. And I had a testimony within me that qualified me. And I knew that I could do it. But somewhere along the line, some things have come in to disqualify me. And yet, I still want to get back to that place where you'll be able to put your stamp of approval upon my life and be able to say, you are sending me forth to do your work. Let's look at some examples in the Bible of people that were qualified but later disqualified. I will first of all concentrate on what qualified them so that we'll be able to see in our lives what qualifies us. One, we'll think about Samson. Two, we'll talk about Saul. Three, we'll examine Solomon. Samson, Saul, Solomon. Let's start with Saul and see what qualified him. What were the things that God saw in his life or God put in his life that qualified that man to be a judge in Israel, a counselor in Israel, a warrior in Israel, a leader in Israel, and the people that will deliver, a deliverer, the person that will deliver the people of God from bondage. Let's look at Judges, chapter 13, from verse 24. And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. Here we have read about Samson. And the only thing that qualified him, the only thing that set him apart, the only thing that made him qualified to work as a judge, as a deliverer, as a leader in Israel, was the Spirit of the Lord upon him. We need to understand that the only thing that makes a difference between us and other people is the Spirit of the Lord upon us. And as you think about being qualified to work for the Lord, you need to begin to understand and you need to begin to examine in your own life how full, how saturated, how influenced, how controlled are you of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And we need to understand, without the Spirit of God, we are nothing. He that is born of the flesh is flesh. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Ye hear the sound thereof. But you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the spirit of God. So, before anybody can be useful in the hand of the Lord or be qualified to do the work of the Lord, he must be born of the Spirit. So is everyone born of the Spirit of God. We have a lot of people in the church world, that's in the nominal church world, that all they depend upon is a diploma, a certificate, 
religious knowledge. But all those religious uh, knowledge and activities that they have without being born of the Spirit will never qualify them to work for the Lord. So the very first thing for me to find out in my life and for you to find out in your life is that was there a time, a time I can place my hand upon, a date I can recollect very well, a place I can remember very well where the Spirit of God convicted me of sin, where the Spirit of God brought me into the kingdom, where the Spirit of God bore witness in my heart that I became a child of God. Not only that, when the Spirit of God removed all condemnation, when the Spirit of God removed all guilt, and then right now I can say, I live by the power of the Spirit of God, made free from the law of sin and death by the Spirit of God that he has given unto us. We cannot live the life of Christ here on earth. Neither can we do the work of Christ here on earth if we do not have the Spirit that was in Christ, that made him live the life he lived, that made him do the work that he did. So, have you been born of the Spirit of God? And as it, as it moved upon you like the wind, directing you, blowing you in the direction that he wants you to be. So the very first thing we note from the life or from the example of Samson, that the thing that made a difference between him and all the Israelites is that he had been filled or born of the Spirit of God. But then we know that everything that he did, he did by the Spirit of God. Verse 25, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him. Began to move him. If we're going to be workers qualified to serve the Lord, we must speak by the Spirit. Not by the human spirit. Not by our emotions. Not by our feelings. You know what disqualifies people? It is that whenever they need to answer a question, whenever they need to relate with people, whenever they need to witness to people, they depend only on their natural knowledge, natural understanding. They are never moved by the Spirit of God. They never answer questions by the Spirit of God. They are never influenced by the Spirit of God. Everything they do is completely natural, completely natural. And if we're going to be qualified for the work of the Lord, you'll begin to discover the moving of the Spirit of God in your life. A temptation will come after you have been born of the Spirit. And that temptation you will never be able to overcome except as the Spirit will move you, as the Spirit will direct you, as the Spirit of God will control you. And eventually it is that same Spirit of God that will be telling you there's still something within your heart that will not allow you to live in the fullness of the life of Christ. Because nobody can show you the presence of the Adamic nature within you except the Spirit of the living God. We can talk about it. You'll never sense it. We can preach about it. You will never feel the burden of that Adamic nature. But after you have been born again of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will so impress upon your heart the weight, the load of the Adamic nature and the inconsistency that that Adamic nature will bring in your life. And every time you will be saying, Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Every time you will be saying, Woe is unto me, because I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. It is the Spirit of God that brings the conviction upon you that that Adamic nature will not make your walk with Christ consistent. It is that same Spirit of God that will make food not have any taste to you. You will say, this sin within me, this corrupt nature within me, this Adamic nature within me, something must be done about it. It is the Spirit of God that will not make you to be at rest, that will go on your knees because every time you try to reply a person, you see that you are impatient. You see that although you cannot say you are really fighting, there is an ugly thing coming out in your heart and it appears that it makes you impatient, it makes you irritated, it makes you almost getting angry, it makes you boisterous, it makes you a little bit proud within you, and the Spirit of God will lay the finger on that and say, that's the thing I'm telling you. That Adamic nature, it will make you inconsistent as long as that thing is there. 
and that spirit of God will so blow upon you, will so move you. It will blow you on your knees and you begin to cry like Jacob. Oh Lord, you must make a change. I will not let you go except you bless me. And the Lord will be asking, what's your name? Who are you? Well, you'll say, I'm a new creature. The spirit of God will say, yes, you are new outwardly. But you are not new internally. Smoking has gone, so you are new outwardly. Drinking has gone, so you are new outwardly. Real fighting and quarreling has gone, so you are new outwardly. Stealing and smuggling have gone, so you are new outwardly. But you are still like you were before, internally. You still get irritated. You still get impatient. And you still get a little bit proud within you. And you are still not like Christ within. Your motive is still having a question mark. Whenever you do something, you have a questionable motive in your heart. What are you going to do about that? What's your name? Oh, you say, well, I know that now I'm new outwardly. But this is the old man within me. Yes, that's the point. Go then to Peniel. Go to the place where you will resolute out, where you will consecrate, where you dig deep before the Lord until the angel of the Lord, the hand of the Lord, will remove that thing out of your nature. And then the thing is uprooted. You know that you are totally free. Now people can offend you. No irritation. Now there is no impatience. Everything has happened, and it is by the Spirit of God. But then you discover that as even though now you are saved, even though now you are sanctified, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness within your heart, that thing has been dealt with. You want to witness. And as you are witnessing, you talk and talk, you quote uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then you quote again, by the works of righteousness, we cannot save ourselves. You quote again, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You quote again, he that is a thirst, let him come. He that heareth, let him come. He that is a thirst, let him take of the water of life freely. And after you have spoken everything, the person you are talking to just said, that's all right, that's all right, I had that before. No conviction. You, you are unhappy. You say, Lord, what's happening? Because I quoted the scripture to that man and I've read of people that when they quote the word of God to people, these people, conviction will seize them. But I preach in the bus, I preach in the house fellowship, I preach everywhere. They're just looking at me like this. I tell them to pray. They don't know how to pray. Lord, what is happening to me? Why are these not people pricked in their conscience? Why are they not saying, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Why are they not saying, sister, this is what I've been looking for. Tell me, how can I be born again? And the Spirit of God will remind you again and say, you've been born again, you've been sanctified, you have not received power. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. We try to witness without the power of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we talk and talk, there is no conviction. And all that we say, when we finish saying it there, the people forget it. But when you are full of the Holy Ghost, when you preach, the people will never forget. When they go back to their houses, they cannot eat, they will be praying. When they go back to their places of work, if they want to do anything like this, everything that you said before by the Spirit of God begins to trouble them. Even the people that appear to reject your word before, when they go away and they want to do anything, they'll see your face, they'll hear your voice, they'll hear everything you were saying before, everything will become confused for them. They'll say, that, that's why I don't like to listen to that man, because when you listen to that man, you're in trouble. You never can forget what he tells you. And you say, Lord, I've read of other people. It's like this with them. Why is it not like this with me? And the Spirit of God begins to ask you the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost, saturated by the Holy Ghost, endued with power from on high? Then you go on your knees again. You say, Lord, I must have this sin. And then you pray a little. And you say, God, Holy Ghost, why have you not come? Oh, he says, um, I don't come to the people that don't seek me wholeheartedly. Ye shall, ye shall seek me and search me and find me. When ye shall seek for me with all your heart. If you are praying for the Holy Ghost, and while you are praying for the Holy Ghost, you say, oh, my soup is burning. Let me go and lower the light. You'll never have the Holy Ghost. If you are saying, well, I want to have the Holy Ghost, but the business partner will be waiting for me now. Holy Ghost, come upon me. Come quickly. Come quickly. Let me speak in tongues. And then your eyes will say, well, Holy Ghost, I can't waste time. I'm going to see the person I want to see. You'll never have the Holy Ghost. But Jesus said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. 
And they all were with one accord there, and they were praying and seeking the face of the Lord. It was when they were wholeheartedly seeking the Lord like that, in unity, that's when the Holy Ghost came upon them. And in the power of the Holy Ghost, they went out and they did the work they ought to do. We're learning from Samson what qualified him. And we learned that everything that he did, when he was qualified, when he was actually doing the work, it was by the Spirit of the Lord. Have you been born of the Spirit? Have you been sanctified of the Spirit? Have you been filled, saturated, baptized with the Spirit of God? Let's move on. What qualified Saul in his own case? Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. And he was a son, and he had a son, whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Here we're looking at Saul, and we're looking at what qualified him. We may say that these are natural qualities, but we need to understand that many times what we read in the Old Testament that appear natural, we are to apply in a supernatural way. As students of the Bible yourself, already we have studied about the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Isn't that natural? And don't you see the spiritual implication we have learned from the tabernacle? And we have learned about the mercy seat before and about two weeks' time again, we'll be learning about it. And isn't that natural? And don't you see the spiritual application? We have learned about Moses, about Joseph, and we have learned about people like David. Don't you know that all the things we have learned in them that look, that appear natural, we find the spiritual implication or interpretation on the life of Jesus Christ? So then let's come to Saul. The thing that we see in the, in the life of Saul is that he was a unique, distinguished, choice young, young man. And I want to tell you, except you distinguish yourself, and you are not just like the meal and run of society, you are not like every other Dick and Harry, except you are like that, you will never be qualified to serve the Lord. You see, there are people that their lives are just like every other person. They are like every other Christian. They are not unique. They are not distinguished. And they will never be able to serve the Lord in a special capacity. Other Christians talk too much. They talk too much. Other Christians are always jesting and always joking. You jest and joke. And there is no difference. You cannot say, look at him. He's behaving like a pastor. Look at him. He's behaving like a shepherd. Look at him, he's like a warrior in the army of the Lord. Look at him, he's always quiet as if he has deep pressure or deep treasure within him that he doesn't talk too much. The only time he talks is when he wants to talk in wisdom. But if you are like just every other person, your family life between you and your husband is just like every other family in the church. Your way of doing business is like every other person does business. The type of business discussions you have is ordinary. It's just like every other person. You are not distinguished as a man of prayer. You are not distinguished as a man of high spiritual principle. You are not distinguished as a man or as a family man who wants to make his family a perfect pattern for other people to follow. You are not a choice young man, a unique young woman. And a distinguished man or woman, you'll never be qualified. But to see what qualified him, he was different. And he said, from his shoulders upward, he was different, he was higher than any of the people. And you need to begin to look at yourself. You say you are a coordinator, you say you are a zonal leader, you say you are an area leader. Are you distinguished? If you laugh the way the people laugh, you are talkative the way the people are talkative. You fight, you quarrel with your wife the way the, ordinary, the other people, ordinary people quarrel. I'm not talking of real fighting. Christians don't fight. Children of God don't fight. But you see, all the other people, family people that are just ordinary members of the church, 
they can get a little bit, uh, you know, ruffled and unhappy and irritated and, you know, these little, little things in their lives, in their family, and they say, well, uh, every family has its own problem. And so, let's settle it now. They're always, you know, quarreling a little and settling, quarreling and settling. That's the generality of the people. How are you distinguished? If you two, you also quarrel and settle. You also get angry and settle. All the other people, what we know about them is that they say, well, pray for me, pastor. I have lost in my heart. When I see women, I do not know what happens to me. Well, if you are a worker, are you distinguished? Are you different from the other people? Or is it also, pastor, pray for me. I'm just like all the other people too. When I see women, I get disturbed. Are you distinguished? Are you different? And yet, what qualified Saul at this time it is that there was a distinction about him. Let's look at verse 15 of that same chapter. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. Thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I speak to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been, you know, just ordinarily sitting somewhere? All of a sudden, somebody is passing. You didn't even look up. But the atmosphere... The presence of God, the power of God, the quietness, the serenity that you say, what's happening? Then you look up and the Spirit of God said, look at my child. I said, no wonder. Before I even saw him, I, I knew that somebody special must be passing around here. The presence of God I felt, the power of God I felt, the impression of the Spirit of God I felt. And then the Spirit of God, when you looked up, said, look at my child. Do people know you like that? Or when you pass, everybody is just doing what they are doing. No distinction. Nothing that distinguishes you except your voice, your authority, and the way you are able to bully on people. That one is not of the spirit. We are talking of the spirit. That while Saul was coming, the spirit of God said, Samuel, look at him. That's the one I spoke to you about. Not somebody that we call an interview, an interview. That's, this is not interview. This is the power and the presence of the Spirit of God attesting, approving a man to be the choice of God. And these are the things that qualify us. That people can look at your life and it commands spiritual respect. Because you are not just a jester. You are not somebody that is going around that everybody knows that where well, he's just uh, his brother so and so. His brother is like, he's a clown. His sister so and so, well, what do you think of sister so and so? It's just that, well, if uh, they don't make high a worker, who will be a worker? If they just disqualify everybody like her, nobody will do the work. That's why they just put her there. No mark, no distinction, no power, no presence of God, and no quietness about you that people will know that person has the hand of God upon her life. That person has the hand of God upon his life. These were the things that qualified these people. Let's look at chapter 10, verse 9. And it was so, that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And I tell you, you'll never lead the people of God with a natural heart. Except you've got a change of heart. A change of nature. You cannot be a leader of the people of God. God gave him another heart. In verses 21 to 23, when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Metra was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord for them. If the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he has hidden, he has hid himself among the store. That's humility. The man had that distinction in his life, that uniqueness in his life, 
He has that approval of God upon his life. And he has uh, that choice of being pointed out by the Spirit of the Lord in his life. And when they eventually chose him, oh, he was so humble that he felt, who am I? I cannot do that thing. You know what disqualifies people? Pride. And does humility mark you out? Can people tell that brother, oh, he's so humble. He never wants to project himself. He never wants to push forward himself. He never wants to assert his own, his own authority. He never wants to draw attention to what he has, who he is, or whatever. So humble, a humble child of God. And the thing that makes people appreciate your life is not how you are able to talk about yourself, and it's not how you project yourself. The thing that actually makes people to think about you is that you are so humble, you don't want to be seen. You don't want to be known. And then in verse 26... And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presence, but he held his peace. The people that disagreed with him, at this time he had no mind to oppress anybody. He had no mind to ill treat anybody. He was a peace-loving man. You know what qualifies us? The attitude that doesn't want to oppress anyone. Even the people that oppose you. Even the people that criticize you. Even the people that don't accept you. They say, no, we don't want that man as coordinator. What did they see in him to choose him? Himself. And you know about the people that criticize you like that. And a person that will be useful for, uh, in the hand of the Lord will never say, ah, those people don't accept me as a leader, I'll show them. At least I've been in the position already, and I will show them. They will never raise their head. They will never serve the Lord. They will never be useful in this zone, not even in the church. I'll cut them down. I will hide them. I will, you know, put a lead on them. I'm going to make sure that I keep them at the background every time. You'll be disqualified yourself. But you know what qualified Saul at this time? He held his peace. Never will he retaliate. Never will he revenge. Never will he oppress anyone. And now we come to Solomon. We've looked at Samson. The things that qualified him. We've looked at Saul. The things that qualified him. Now Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 3. And Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of David, his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. He loved the Lord. Sacrificing and burning incense in high places here means that because the proper altar had not been reared up, and because the place of ordained worship had not been established, because of that, in the high places that were available, he made sacrifices. That wasn't the perfect will of God for Israel because Israel was supposed to sacrifice in the place appointed by God. But God knew that he was just um, doing the best he could in the situation he found himself. But the point that was specific and unique about him, he loved the Lord. Loved the Lord. You see, this is one single thing that qualifies a man to serve the people of God. No matter what quality a person has, and you mark it down, no matter what talent a person has, no matter what resources a person may have, without love, he will be totally useless. Even the devil has knowledge. Even the devil has great strict control. He moved and he drafted one third of the angels of heaven to follow after him. Even the devil has administration, principalities, and powers. Rulers of the, of the darkness of this world. Even the devil can be very, very energetic. He goes up and down, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Even the devil will try to manage time. He's coming in a great trust, knowing that he has but a short time. What do people have that they say, well, I can be a great leader? They know a little about time management. Even the devil knows that. 
They know how to be able to draft people and, re and um, you know, recruit people and tell them you must do this and drive them until they work their fingers to the bone. Even the devil can work his demons like that. But what qualifies a man, what makes him different from the devil, is the deep love of God. That's what the devil doesn't have. And if you're thinking about what qualifies a man, what qualifies a woman, one, he loves God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. He would rather part with his right hand than part of the love of God. He loves God to the point he can give up anything. He can give up anything. Anything that conflicts, that contradicts the call of God upon his life, he loves the Lord enough to cut off that thing. Let me ask you, how much do you love God? And we know when the Lord tells you, separate from that unbelieving woman. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You say, because that's the word of the Lord, I love the Lord enough, I have to separate from that person. There's a business partner that... As a business partner, that person can bring a lot of gain. He has a lot of contacts in the world as an unbeliever. And the things you cannot do as a believer, that business, uh, so-called business partner can do. He can give bribe, can see all those allergies, can see all those government functionaries. But the word of God says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Not even in business. And your love for God makes you to be able to part with that person. I know the lot of... Um, gain that you can bring into the business but the word of god commands me i must not go along with you that's the love of god that's the love of god in your place they are telling you now all the families they are coming together come and do this well you look at it you say god has his call upon my life i'm a child of god and my family people are saying i should do this you say no they say if you do not do this thing we're telling you to do we'll reject you as a child well, you say, I don't want you to reject me, but I'm a Christian. I cannot do this. Then we say, everybody says, that you are not part of the family anymore. You say, well, I'm sorry. I would have to accept that. You reject me as part of the family. I belong to the family of God. Your love for God makes you to even accept you're being rejected by your people because you are not going to contradict the word of God. That's the love of God. And the person that will be qualified to serve the Lord, this is the one thing in his life, the love of God. Not only that, the love of the word of God. You see, when you love God, you love what belongs to God. And the word of God is coming from the very heart of God. I want you to think for a moment of all the things in this world. The houses, the universities, the motor vehicles, the aeroplanes, all the properties in the world, the oil, the minerals, and the Bible. Which one do you think is the greatest thing that is very close to the heart of God? Is the Bible. Is the Word. And God will watch over that Word. You know what that means? If you love the Word of God, like you love God, it will mean that you'll place the Word of God above aeroplanes above motor vehicle, above your job, above the material things of this world, above promotion in the place of work, above getting a new contract. You place the word of God because it's so near the heart of God. Because it is near the heart of God, it is near your heart. It is the most uh, important possession on the face of the earth, in the sight of God. And because of that, it's the same thing to you. But don't we know people that say they want to work for God? They want to be pastors. If they see Naira, they throw away the Bible. If they see, if somebody will promise them a motor vehicle, they change the doctrine of the word of God. But the thing that qualifies you to be able to serve God is that you love God, you love the word of God. Not only that, you love the people of God. What did Jesus die for? Husbands, love your wives. As Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. And as you think about it right now, I want to ask you a question similar to the one I asked you before. That Jesus Christ now, as he thinks about all the people in the world, here we have in Lagos here, we have the president and we have the place where he lives and we have a humble place where two or three are gathered in Christ's name. 
If Jesus were to come today, where will he go? Will he go to Jordan Barracks? Because the people there, they are highly placed. They have government power. They have authority. They have everything. Or will he rather go to some humble congregation where the people love him? They may not have vehicle. They may not have certificate. Where will Jesus go? Will he go where the ammunitions are? Where the money is? Where the people are? Where the seat of government is? Or will he rather look for the people? They may be villagers. They may be people that do not know anything. But they are the people of God. They are born again. You know where Jesus will go? He will bypass all those palaces. He will bypass all those barracks. He will bypass all those uh, government seats. He will bypass all those secretariats. And he will get to the place where people are calling on his name. How about you? Where would you rather go? Where you have the children of God in a house fellowship somewhere. They are humble. They don't have any vehicle. They don't have any money. They don't have any name. Nobody knows them except God. And there is another place where there is dancing, where there is drinking, where there are people that are highly placed, where there are vehicles, where they spray money like anything, where would you rather go? That's the test of being qualified. Where Jesus will go. What's close to the heart of Jesus? The love of God, the love of the word of God, the love of the people of God. How many people have separated from the people of God? And they say, my people, they don't like me to be in the church. And because I cannot offend my people, there we are. He cannot offend his people. The people of God are not his people. The family of God, they are not his people. He doesn't love the family of God, the people of God, more than the people of the world. Because after all, it's my uncle that trained me. Uh -huh. So you love your uncle that trained you, an unbeliever, more than the children of God. After all, if I die eventually, those are my people. It's uh, to my people, they will carry me and bury me. And because of that now, the children of God. After all, when I was looking for accommodation and I needed the money, all the children of God, I begged, I begged, I begged. Nobody gave me anything. It's my uncle that I rejected when I became a believer. I went to him and, I, and he said, uh -huh, you come back now. Your church people, they cannot help you now. You now know that I'm uncle, that uncle is there. In any case, get and go. And you say, ah, uh -huh. you see, church people now, they couldn't help me. It's my, it's my unbelieving relative that helped me. I am going. Then he goes to his uncle. They are disqualified. And you say, I'm not backslidden. Only I was disappointed. You are disqualified. Because you know what qualifies us is the love of God, the love of the word of God, and the love of the people of God. That's what we're learning here. And Solomon loved the Lord. And then... In verse 9, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? He needed wisdom. And God gave him the wisdom the wisdom to lead, the wisdom to rule, and the wisdom to guide. And if we're going to be qualified in leading the people of God, we must have wisdom. Let's summarize everything that we have learned from Samson, from Saul, from Solomon. The things that qualify us, one, a change of heart. We must come to the Lord and the Spirit of God must so work in us that our hearts, our lives are changed. Two, we must be led of that Spirit of God to sanctification and that sanctification will bring the love of God within our hearts. To love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our minds. And to love the Bible, the word of God. You will rather part with your hand. You will rather part with a bosom friend than part with any doctrine of the word of God. That doctrine is your joy. That doctrine is the thing that makes you to say, Lord, I will never leave you. That doctrine may be like a two-edged sword, very, very sharp. And every time I hear it, it cuts me. It heals me down and it brings me to pieces. It convicts me. It challenges me. But Lord, I love your word. Your word have I loved more than hidden treasure. Then you love the people of God so much. Number three, the uniqueness of your life that distinguishes you. You are not a clown like every other person. You are not a jester like every other person. 
You are not a person easily irritated like, you know, all the other people. You are not somebody easily discouraged like every other person. You are not a person that is leading your family like every other person. You have a distinction, a uniqueness in your own life. Number four, humility. Five, the spirit of God upon you. You are saturated. You are empowered. You are enveloped. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Number six, wisdom. To lead and to guide. But all these people I have talked to you about, Samson, Saul, Solomon, they were disqualified later. Why? For Samson, lost of the flesh. For Samson, the unequal yoke. Watch those two things in your life, that even though you have been qualified before, even though you have been called of God before, the lost of the flesh. How many people have said they were called of God before? But then they left their wives and they went after other women. Some of them have actually even gone into polygamy to marry those people. Others that have not married other women, they allowed the lust of the flesh to take authority over them, to take the preeminence over them. Some of them have gone into shameful private acts. And in their hearts, they know they are disqualified. Satan knows that they are disqualified. Satan doesn't reckon with such people, the people that are living in the lust of the flesh. They may preach. Satan doesn't reckon with them. God doesn't reckon with them. The angels of God don't reckon with them. The lust of the flesh will disqualify you as a disqualified something. The unequal yoke, get her for me for wife. For she pleases me well. That unequal yoke will disqualify you. Unequal yoke in business will disqualify you. How many people have been running and running? I want to serve the Lord. I want to run the race. And then when they are praying to get married, they get into trouble. There's a lady in their place of work. And that lady will come to them every time when they are working, will come and take their biro and then will say, I don't like this. I don't like this. And we'll say, ah, it's because I like you, it's because I love you. Won't you get married? And then all the people in the office, they are teasing him. And they are saying, ah, ah you are lucky that uh, Miss So-and-so is, uh, you know, running after you. Ah, you are even lucky if I were you, I would just grab the opportunity. And originally you are saying, no, no, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Eventually, you say, well, even this church that we say we belong to, uh, we pray, pray, pray. We say this sister, they say it's not the will of God. We say this one, they say go and see marriage committee. And eventually we'll be asking the uh, lady, will you follow me to church? Will you serve the God I'm serving? Ah, that one will say, ah, if I don't serve the God you are serving, why did I say I love you? I will serve your God. You want me to be deeper life? I will be deeper life more than you. If you'll be deeper life more than me, let us go then. And then you marry, you are disqualified. If you are not careful, you will lose your very soul. That woman, the devil will plant him against your life to make sure that he brings you back, not only brings you from the church to the world, bring you from the kingdom of God to hell. The unequal yoke. Number three, partial obedience. That's the thing that ruined Saul. The Lord told him, go and destroy the Amalekites. He did much, only Agag remained. You know, there are people in their lives that are saying, well, I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm sanctified. Only this little thing in my life, that's the thing that disqualified Saul. Only this little thing. And there is a reason for it. We brought it back so that we can offer it to the Lord. There's always an excuse for disobedience and partial obedience. And that's the thing that disqualifies people. Have you not been disqualified? When you are trying to practice Christianity with human wisdom, and you say, well, I know what they teach in the church, but <laughs> if I follow everything 100%, who can follow that? I will do it with wisdom. I know we should not lie, but I will manage the thing. I will color it. I will paint it. That's the thing that disqualifies you. I know we shouldn't give bribe, but I'm not giving him bribe. I'm only, you know, trying to appreciate what uh, he will do. He has not done it, but I'm just trying to appreciate, to give him the money. It's not bribe. I don't call it bribe in my own case. I, I don't give bribe. I'm only appreciating what he will do for me. You are disqualified. God knows what is bribe. Is it you that will define bribe to God? Is it you that will teach God what is bribe and what is not bribe? And you will say, I'm not giving him bribe. 
And then the policeman stops you and uh, he's saying, ah, your particulars are not complete. And, uh, well, I will take you to court and they, they will charge you, they charge you to court. Then you have to pay this fine. You, if you are not careful, 250 Naira will not get you out of this problem. Well, you say, uh, he is a government representative. If I go to this court now, I pay 250 Naira to the court. Why don't I give everything, whether police or court or government, everything is government. I say, my friend, come. I'm not giving you bribe or I'm a Christian. But the way you have been dealing with me, that you didn't uh, harass me, and you didn't do this, and I know you have been gentle with me, this is not bribe. This is just appreciation. If you just have this hundred naira, uh, who doesn't know bribe? Is it you that will tell us that that is not bribe, and then after you give him the hundred naira, or just appreciation, that one is not bribe, and then policeman say, well, thank you very much. I didn't get bribe from you. I only got appreciation from you. Now you can go. Uh, uh, who doesn't know you are disqualified? You have gone. And that is what hinders people. Those little, little things. I will try this one. I will manage this one. I will use cleverness here. I will use wisdom here. Those are the things that disqualify. Bitterness, anger, malice. He disqualified Saul. And he will throw javelin at David. Throw javelin at, at um, Jonathan, his son. And say, you son of a perverse woman. Have you not chosen, Jonah, have you not chosen David to be your friend? So that he can take the throne away from you. As long as David, the son of Jesus, is alive, you'll never come to the throne. Go and bring him that I may kill him. And when you begin to have bitterness, you are all easily irritated. The children are doing something. You say, if I come to knock you like there, you will, you will smell pepper. And the children, they have to be very, very, uh, very, very afraid. And it's your wife, you, you came back from a place of work, and uh, you are a worker. Uh -uh. Food is not ready. No, my brother, I've been trying and it is, I told you that you should buy a um, better stove. This one that uses kerosene, it wastes a lot of time. Okay. Anyway, when you finish the cooking, eat it yourself. I'll give myself to the Lord. No food anymore. So just take care of yourself. Ah, uh, brother, are you hungry? Don't count sin on me. How can I be angry? I'm a child of God. I'm not angry, but eat your food. Uh, who doesn't know anger? Even little children know anger. The bitterness. Husband and wife in the night, uh, sister, I need to release uh, my body and all. Ah, you know, brother, I am weak now. You are weak. Okay, you are weak. You are weak. Go. Tomorrow, good morning, brother. Good morning. I have a quiet time now. You are weak. Go and do your quiet time. <laughs> but I don't do like this. No, no, I want to go to heaven. I want to be serious. All this. Even husband and wife. It's only in the world we talk of husband and wife. In heaven, where we are going. No husband and wife. Go your way. I go my way. I want to serve God now. Even this, uh, I want to do this. I want to do this. It's when we are thinking about the world that we are talking about all that. Go your way now. I, no, no relationship, nothing. Now it's heaven alone that I want. Come to the table, let us sit together. No, no, I want to consecrate myself to the Lord now. But that is angry. And he says he's not angry. He is fighting. He's holding malice. And he says that he's still a child of God. And he's still leading us fellowship. Still a zonal leader. And he's still doing a lot of things. Disqualified. Isn't that what disqualified Saul? That anger and bitterness. And then he started oppressing people. And he would go to, he said, ah, all you people, the son of Jesse came here and you were hiding him. What has he given to you? And then he'll be chasing after David about. And when you begin to oppress people because of envy, because of jealousy, you don't want them to rise up. Already you are disqualified. And then eventually he consulted with familiar spirit. He went to the occult. And God said, that's enough. He died. For Solomon, it's polygamy. He will marry from here. Every, if she sees a lady today, ah, why did I get married before? This one is more beautiful than my wife. Come here. Will you marry me? Oh yes, I will marry you. After marrying that one from, uh, from the Philistines, he'll see another one. Ah, ah, 
Why did I marry that one? This one is more beautiful than the last wife. He'll marry that one again. Every lady is more beautiful than the last lady. And that's the, peop the problem that some people have. They've married already, but when they see another lady in the church, on the road, in the bus, in the office, this is more beautiful than the one I saw yesterday. That's how they were disqualified. How about you? Lost of the flesh, the unequal yoke, partial obedience, bitterness, anger, malice, oppression and envy, consulting with the occult. You have a problem in your life and you go to the herbalist. You have a problem and you go to all this and you say, well, I'm not going to herbalist in my own case. But these uh, people, they pray on the mountain and I'm going to them so that they will pray for me. We have prayed at uh, our church and the problem has not been solved. These people that pray on the mountain, let me go to them. I know they burn candles, but that's not my problem. The candle is just to give light. We use the candle light to see the Bible. Who are you deceiving? God knows your heart. And it's like you are going back to occultism. Or for you, it is just women. And women. Or for the women, it is men. That says, ah, my husband. Why did I marry this, my husband? This man that I see today is more handsome than the one of uh, yesterday. Uh -uh. In any case, I don't think, uh, after all, uh, God is a merciful God. That doesn't mean that uh, once somebody goes to do this and do that, that God will reject the person totally. Uh, look at Saul. God rejected him totally. Look at Samson. He lost his eyes and eventually he died. How do you want to die? You want to die like Saul? You want to die like Samson? Or you want to die like Solomon? That by the time Solomon died, even his son was not wise enough to keep the kingdom. And it was the servant Jeroboam that eventually took ten tribes away. And only two tribes were left with Solomon, a wise man. Nobody as wise as himself in the whole of Israel, before him or even after him. Yet he was a failure. The Lord wants us to examine our, our lives and ourselves. Are you qualified? And if you have been qualified, are you striving and trying and doing your best that you remain qualified? Or will you allow any of these things to disqualify you? Let's rise up and pray.
name we are praying. In Jesus' name we are praying. In Jesus' name we are praying. Our Father and our God, we thank you very much for this wonderful day. We want to bless your name because of this wonderful love you have for us. We thank you very much for a time like this that can speak to our hearts again. We magnify your name because you have come down from above and you have spoken your mind unto every one of us. Father, accept our thanks and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, you have made us to see the giants of the old. You have made us to see those people who are very, very serious, who committed themselves unto you. You have made us to see the life of Samson. You have made us to see how he was serious and unique among all other people in the, in the world. You have made us to see the life of Solomon. Solomon, who, who was very, very serious for you. Solomon, who was being exploited for you. You have made us to see the life of oh, oh Saul also, who was unique, even among others. And indeed, oh, you, you, you gave him the power. You gave him his ideal authority. You gave him the nature of God. But eventually he went back again. Father, we don't want to go back. We are praying loving Father that you will put every one of us in Jesus' name. Father, we have started in a wonderful way. We have changed our lives. We have changed everything about us. And you have made us to be, to be people who can walk in your house. You have made us to be vessels of honor in your house. You have recognized us in your house. You have made us to be people of God. Father, we magnify your holy name. Father, we don't want to go back. That first love that we had in the past, that will make us to run errands for you. That first love that we had in the past, that will make us to do evangelism. That first love that we had in the past, that will make us to pray and pray and pray. In the morning we will pray. In the afternoon we will pray. In the night we will pray. We want to go up and down for you. Father, we are asking. That first love, we pray that to return to every one of us in Jesus' name. Father, we want to be special people. In the church, we want to be special people. In our offices, we want to be special people. In the home, we want to be special people. Among the members of the family, we want to be special people. As husbands, we want to be special people. As wives, we want to be special people. Father, we are asking that to make us special in Jesus' name. All the bitterness in our lives, all the anger in our lives, all the pride in our lives, and we all carry all this about and we say we are Christians, we are asking in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that we remove everything completely in Jesus' name. We lay everything on the altar of sacrifice. We want to consecrate our life unto you the more. Father, we are praying, loving Father, that the, 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 the mind to love you more, the mind to do expert for you more. Father, we are asking that you give unto us in Jesus' name. And our Father, we worship you. To this another day, you have decided to bless us with your words. Father, we have heard from you. We want to be obedient unto you. We saw Saul was disobedient. He was disobedient. And that's why you removed the kingdom from his hand. We saw Solomon was disobedient. And we couldn't even make use of his children. Oh, Father, we are asking that the spirit of disobedience be removed from our lives in the name of Jesus. We want to obey you. If we obey you, we obey the church. If we obey you, we obey our leaders. Father, we are asking, Lord Jesus, that all the disobedience in our lives, Father, we are asking that to crucify to the cross of Calvary in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are here to learn from you. Like Jesus went with Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration. And indeed, they were really, they saw the mightiness of God. They saw the glory of God. Here we have come to the Mount of Transfiguration here. Who is just lacking to the Mount of Transfiguration. And we want to see you transfigure yourself even in, in our presence. We are asking, loving Father, that we will not go back the same from this place in Jesus' name. Lay your hands upon us. Transform our lives. Renew our spirits. Put your nature in our hearts. Father, we are asking, Lord, as we continue this meeting, we pray, Lord Jesus, that every one of us, Lord Jesus, will not be the same again in Jesus' name. We commit our pastor unto you, Lord Jesus. We are asking for more of your understanding, more of your wisdom, more of your power, more of your anointing upon him. More and more, we are asking, Lord, that you strengthen him in Jesus' name. Father, we magnify your name. Father, we bless your name. Father, we worship your name. We thank you because we believe you have answered our prayers. Glory and honor be to your holy name. In Jesus' name.